During a lull in the battle late in the afternoon, General Grant, in company with two staff officers, strolled over toward the Germana Road. While we stood on the bank of a small rivulet, a drove of beef cattle was driven past. One of the animals strayed into the stream and had evidently made up its mind to part company with its fellows and come over to our side. One of the drovers yelled out to the general, who was a little in advance of his officers, I say, stranger, head off that beef critter for me, will you? The general, having always prided himself upon being a practical farmer, felt as much at home in handling cattle as in directing armies, and without changing countenance at once stepped forward, threw up his hands and shouted to the animal. It stopped, took a look at him, and then, as if sufficiently impressed with this show of authority, turned back into the road. The general made no comment whatever upon this incident, and seemed to think no more about the salutation he had received than if someone had presented arms to him. He knew, of course, that the man did not recognize him. If he had supposed the man was lacking in proper military respect, he would perhaps have administered to him the same lesson which he once taught a soldier in the 21st Illinois when he commanded that regiment. An officer who had served under him at the time told me that Colonel Grant, as he came out of his tent one morning, found a strapping big fellow posted as sentinel, who nodded his head good-naturedly, smiled blandly, and said, Howdy, Colonel. His commander cried, Hand me your piece, and upon taking it, faced the soldier and came to a present arms. Then, handing back the musket, he remarked, That is the way to say, How do you do to your colonel? It was now about sundown. The storm of battle which had raged with unabated fury from early dawn had been succeeded by a calm. The contemplated general attack at six o'clock had been abandoned on account of the assault of the enemy on Hancock's front, and the difficulty of perfecting the alignments and supplying the men with ammunition. It was felt that the day's strife had ended, unless Lee should risk another attack. Just then the stillness was broken by heavy volleys of musketry on our extreme right, which told that Sedgwick had been assaulted and was actually engaged with the enemy. The attack against which the general-in-chief during the day had ordered every precaution to be taken had now been made. Meade was at Grant's headquarters at the time. They had just left the top of the knoll and were standing in front of General Grant's tent talking to Mr. Washburn. Staff officers and couriers were soon seen galloping up to Meade's headquarters, and his chief of staff, General Humphreys, sent word that the attack was directed against our extreme right, and that a part of Sedgwick's line had been driven back in some confusion. Generals Grant and Meade, accompanied by me and one or two other staff officers, walked rapidly over to Meade's tent, and found that the reports still coming in were bringing news of increasing disaster. It was soon reported that General Shaler and part of his brigade had been captured, then that General Seymour and several hundred of his men had fallen into the hands of the enemy, afterward that our right had been turned, and Ferrero's division cut off and forced back upon the Rapidan. General Humphreys, on receiving the first reports, had given prompt instructions with a view to strengthening the point of the line attacked. General Grant now took the matter in hand with his accustomed vigor. Darkness had set in, but the firing still continued. Aides came galloping in from the right, laboring under intense excitement, talking wildly, and giving the most exaggerated reports of the engagement. Some declared that a large force had broken and scattered Sedgwick's entire corps. Others insisted that the enemy had turned our right completely and captured the wagon train. It was asserted at one time that both Sedgwick and Wright had been captured. Such tales of disaster would have been enough to inspire serious apprehension in daylight and under ordinary circumstances. In the darkness of the night, in the gloom of a tangled forest, and after men's nerves had been racked by the strain of a two days desperate battle, the most immovable commander might have been shaken. But it was in just such sudden emergencies that General Grant was always at his best. Without the change of a muscle of his face, or the slightest alteration in the tones of his voice, he quietly interrogated the officers who brought the reports. Then, sifting out the truth from the mass of exaggerations, he gave directions for relieving the situation with the marvelous rapidity, which was always characteristic of him when directing movements in the face of an enemy. Reinforcements were hurried to the point attacked, 
and preparations made for Sedwick's corpse to take up a new line, with the front and right thrown back. General Grant soon walked over to his own camp, seated himself on a stool in front of his tent, lighted a fresh cigar, and there continued to receive further advices from the right. A general officer came in from his command at this juncture and said to the general-in-chief, speaking rapidly and laboring under considerable excitement, General Grant, this is a crisis that cannot be looked upon too seriously. I know Lee's methods well by past experience. He will throw his whole army between us and the Rapidan and cut us off completely from our communications. The general rose to his feet, took his cigar out of his mouth, turned to the officer and replied with a degree of animation which he seldom manifested, Oh, I am heartily tired of hearing about what Lee is going to do. Some of you always seem to think he is suddenly going to turn a double somersault and land in our rear and on both of our flanks at the same time. Go back to your command and try to think what we are going to do ourselves instead of what Lee is going to do. The officer retired, rather crestfallen, and without saying a word in reply. This recalls a very pertinent criticism regarding his chief once made in my presence by General Sherman. He said, Grant always seemed pretty certain to win when he went into a fight with anything like equal numbers. I believe the chief reason why he was more successful than others was that while they were thinking so much about what the enemy was going to do, Grant was thinking all the time about what he was going to do himself. Hancock came to headquarters about 8 p.m., and had a conference with the General-in-Chief and General Meade. He had had a very busy day on his front, and while he was cheery and showed that there was still plenty of fight left in him, he manifested signs of fatigue after his exhausting labors. General Grant, in offering him a cigar, found that only one was left in his pocket. Deducting the number he had given away from the supply he had started out with in the morning showed that he had smoked that day about twenty, all very strong and of formidable size. But it must be remembered that it was a particularly long day. He never afterward equaled that record in the use of tobacco. The general, after having given his final orders providing for any emergency which might arise, entered his tent and threw himself down upon his camp bed. Ten minutes thereafter, an alarming report was received from the right. I looked in his tent and found him sleeping as soundly and as peacefully as an infant. I woke him and communicated the report. His military instincts convinced him that it was a gross exaggeration, and as he had already made every provision for meeting any renewed attempts against the right, he turned over in his bed and immediately went to sleep again. Twenty-one years thereafter, as I sat by his deathbed, when his sufferings had become agonizing, and he was racked by the tortures of insomnia, I recalled to him that night in the wilderness. He said, Ah, yes, it seems strange that I, who always slept so well in the field, should now pass whole nights in the quiet of this peaceful house without being able to close my eyes. It was soon ascertained that although Sedgwick's line had been forced back with some loss and Shaler and Seymour had been made prisoners, only a few hundred men had been captured and the enemy had been compelled to withdraw. General Grant had great confidence in Sedgwick in such an emergency, and the event showed that it was not misplaced. The attack on our right and its repulse ended the memorable battle of the wilderness. The losses were found to be killed, 2246, wounded, 12,037, missing, 3383, total, 17,666. The damage inflicted upon the enemy is not known, but as he was the assaulting party as often as the Union Army, there is reason to believe that the losses on the two sides were about equal. Taking twenty-four hours as the time actually occupied in fighting and counting the casualties in both armies, it will be found that on that bloody field every minute recorded the loss of twenty-five men, as the staff officers threw themselves upon the ground that night, sleep came to them without coaxing. They had been on the move since dawn, galloping over bad roads, struggling about through forest openings, jumping rivulets, wading swamps, helping to rally troops, dodging bullets, and searching for commanding officers in all sorts of unknown places. Their horses had been crippled, and they themselves were well-nigh exhausted. 
For the small part I had been able to perform in the engagement, the general recommended me for the brevet rank of major in the regular army for gallant and meritorious services. His recommendation was afterward approved by the president. This promotion was especially gratifying for the reason that it was conferred for conduct in the first battle in which I had served under the command of the general-in-chief. There were features of the battle which have never been matched in the annals of warfare. For two days nearly two hundred thousand veteran troops had struggled in a death grapple, confronted at each step with almost every obstacle by which nature could bar their path and groping their way through a tangled forest, the impenetrable gloom of which could be likened only to the shadow of death. The undergrowth stayed their progress, the upper growth shut out the light of heaven. Officers could rarely see their troops for any considerable distance, for smoke clouded the vision, and a heavy sky obscured the sun. Directions were ascertained, and lines established by means of the pocket compass, and a change of position often presented an operation more like a problem of ocean navigation than a question of military maneuvers. It was the sense of sound and of touch rather than the sense of sight which guided the movements. It was a battle fought with the ear and not with the eye. All circumstances seemed to combine to make the scene one of unutterable horror. At times the wind howled through the treetops, mingling its moans with the groans of the dying, and heavy branches were cut off by the fire of the artillery, and fell crashing upon the heads of the men, adding a new terror to battle. Forest fires raged, ammunition trains exploded, the dead were roasted in the conflagration, the wounded, roused by its hot breath, dragged themselves along with their torn and mangled limbs in the mad energy of despair to escape the ravages of the flames, and every bush seemed hung with shreds of blood-stained clothing. It was as though Christian men had turned to fiends, and hell itself had usurped the place of earth. Chapter Fee Grant's Third Day in the Wilderness, Hail to the Chief A Night Alarm, A Midnight Ride, Grant Roughs It with His Troops, Out of the Wilderness Sheridan Ordered to Crush Jeb Stuart, A Chapter of Accidents, Grant in Front of Spotsylvania, The Death of Sedgwick, Arrival of Dispatches I shall take no backward steps. The next morning, May 7th, General Grant was almost the first one up. He seated himself at the campfire at dawn and looked thoroughly refreshed after the sound sleep he had enjoyed. In fact, a night's rest had greatly reinvigorated everyone. A fog, combined with the smoke from the smoldering forest fires, rendered it difficult for those of us who were sent to make reconnaissances to see any great distance even where there were openings in the forest. A little after 6 a.m., there was some artillery firing from Warren's batteries, which created an impression for a little while that the enemy might be moving against him. But he soon sent word that he had been firing at some skirmishers who had pushed down to a point near his entrenchments and discharged a few shots. At 6.30 a.m., the general issued his orders to prepare for a night march of the entire army toward Spotsylvania Courthouse, on the direct road to Richmond. At 8.30, Burnside pushed out a skirmishing party to feel the enemy and found that he had withdrawn from a portion of his line. Skirmishing continued along parts of Warren's front till 11 a.m. In fact, each army was anxious to learn promptly the position and apparent intentions of the other so as to be able to act intelligently in making the next move in the all-absorbing game. The enemy was found to be occupying a strongly entrenched line, defended by artillery, and at an average distance from our front of nearly a mile. While sitting at the mess table taking breakfast, I asked the general-in-chief, In all your battles up to this time, where do you think your presence upon the field was most useful in accomplishing results? He replied, Well, I don't know. Then, after a pause, Perhaps at Shiloh. I said, I think it was last night when the attack was made on our right. He did not follow up the subject, for he always spoke with great reluctance about anything which was distinctly personal to himself. The only way in which we could ever draw him out and induce him to talk about events in his military career was to make some misstatement intentionally about an occurrence.
His regard for truth was so great that his mind always rebelled against inaccuracies, and in his desire to correct the error, he would go into an explanation of the facts, and in doing so would often be led to talk with freedom upon the subject. An officer related to the general an incident of the attack the night before, which showed that even the gravest events have a comical side. In the efforts to strengthen our right, a number of Teamsters had been ordered into the ranks and sent hurriedly to the front. As they were marching past their teams, one of the men was recognized by his favorite lead mule, who proceeded to pay his respects to him in a friendly hee-haw, which reverberated through the forest until the sound bid fair to rival the report of the opening gun at Lexington, which fired the shot heard round the world. The teamster turned to him and cried, Oh, you better not laugh, old Simon Bolivar. Before this fight's through, I bet they'll pick you up and put you into the ranks, too. After leaving the breakfast table, the general lighted a cigar and took his seat on a camp stool in front of his tent. In a conversation with the staff, he then began to discuss the operations of the day before. He expressed himself as satisfied with the result in the main, saying, While it is in one sense a drawn battle, as neither side has gained or lost ground substantially since the fighting began, yet we remain in possession of the field, and the forces opposed to us have withdrawn to a distance from our front and taken up a defensive position. We cannot call the engagement a positive victory, but the enemy have only twice actually reached our lines in their many attacks and have not gained a single advantage. This will enable me to carry out my intention of moving to the left and compelling the enemy to fight in a more open country and outside of their breastworks. An old officer who was passing by, an acquaintance of the general's, now stepped up to the group. He had recently been ordered in from the plains, and his wild tales of red-handed slaughter in the land of the savages had already made him known in the army as the Injun Slayer. An aide remarked to him, Well, as you've been spoiling for a fight ever since you joined this army, how did yesterday's set to strike you by way of a skirmish? Oh, was the reply. You had large numbers engaged and heavy losses, but it wasn't the picturesque, desperate hand-to-hand -hand fighting that you see when you're among the Injuns. No, but we got in some pretty neat work on the white man, said the aide. Yes, but it didn't compare with the time the Nez Perses and the Shoshone tribes had their big battle, continued the veteran. Why, how was that? cried all present in a chorus. Well, you see, explained the narrator, First, the Nez Perses set up a yell louder than a blast of Gabriel's trumpet and charged straight across the valley. But the Shoshanese stood their ground without budging an inch, and pretty soon they went for the Nez Perses and drove them back again. As soon as the Nez Perses could catch their breath, they took another turn at the Shoshones and shoved them back just about where they started from. By this time, the ground between them was so covered by the killed and wounded that you couldn't see as much as a blade of grass. But still, they kept on charging back and forth across that valley, and they moved so fast that when their lines of battle passed me, the wind they made was so strong that I had to hold my hat on with both hands, and once I came mighty near being blown clear off my feet. Why, where were you all this time? asked several voices. Oh, said he. I was standing on a little knoll in the middle of the valley, looking on. Why, remarked an officer, I should think they would have killed you in the scrimmage. Then the face of the veteran of the plains assumed an air of offended innocence, and in a tone of voice which made it painfully evident that he felt the hurt, he said, What? The Injuns? Lord, they all knew me. The general joined in the smiles which followed this bit of sadly mutilated truth. Similar Munchausenisms, indulged in from time to time by this officer, demonstrated the fact that he had become so skilled in warping veracity that one of his lies could make truth look mean alongside of it, and he finally grew so untrustworthy that it was unsafe even to believe the contrary of what he said. At 3 p.m., dispatches were received by way of Washington, saying that General Butler had reached the junction of the James and Appomattox Rivers the night of the 5th, had surprised the enemy, and successfully disembarked his troops, and that Sherman was moving out against Johnston in Georgia, 
and expected that a battle would be fought on the 7th. All preparations for the night march had now been completed. The wagon trains were to move at 4 p.m. so as to get a start of the infantry, and then go into park and let the troops pass them. The cavalry had been thrown out in advance. The infantry began the march at 8.30 p.m. Warren was to proceed along the Brock Road toward Spotsylvania Courthouse, moving by the rear of Hancock, whose corps was to remain in its position during the night to guard against a possible attack by the enemy, and afterward to follow Warren. Sedgwick was to move by way of Chancellorsville and Piney Branch Church. Burnside was to follow Sedgwick and to cover the trains which moved on the roads that were farthest from the enemy. Soon after dark, Generals Grant and Meade, accompanied by their staffs, after having given personal supervision to the starting of the march, rode along the Brock Road toward Hancock's headquarters, with the intention of waiting there till Warren's troops should reach that point. While moving close to Hancock's line, there occurred an unexpected demonstration on the part of the troops, which created one of the most memorable scenes of the campaign. Notwithstanding the darkness of the night, the form of the commander was recognized, and word was passed rapidly along that the chief who had led them through the mazes of the wilderness was again moving forward with his horse's head turned toward Richmond. Troops know but little about what is going on in a large army except the occurrences which take place in their immediate vicinity. But this night ride of the general-in-chief told plainly the story of success and gave each man to understand that the cry was to be, On to Richmond! Soldiers weary and sleepy after their long battle, with stiffened limbs and smarting wounds, now sprang to their feet, forgetful of their pains, and rushed forward to the roadside. Wild cheers echoed through the forest, and glad shouts of triumph rent the air. Men swung their hats, tossed up their arms, and pressed forward to within touch of their chief, clapping their hands and speaking to him with the familiarity of comrades. Pine knots and leaves were set on fire and lighted the scene with their weird flickering glare. The night march had become a triumphal procession for the new commander. The demonstration was the emphatic verdict pronounced by the troops upon his first battle in the East. The excitement had been imparted to the horses, which soon became restive, and even the general's large bay, over which he possessed ordinarily such perfect control, became difficult to manage. Instead of being elated by this significant ovation, the general, thoughtful only of the practical question of the success of the movement, said, This is most unfortunate. The sound will reach the ears of the enemy, and I fear it may reveal our movement. By his direction, staff officers rode forward and urged the men to keep quiet so as not to attract the enemy's attention. But the demonstration did not really cease until the general was out of sight. When Hancock's headquarters were reached, the party remained with him for some time, awaiting the arrival of the head of Warren's troops. Hancock's wound received at Gettysburg had not thoroughly healed, and he suffered such inconvenience from it when in the saddle that he had applied for permission to ride in a spring ambulance while on the march and when his troops were not in action. He was reclining upon one of the seats of the ambulance, conversing with General Grant, who had dismounted and was sitting on the ground with his back against a tree, whittling a stick when the sound of firing broke forth directly in front. Hancock sprang up, seized his sword which was lying near him, buckled it around his waist, and cried, My horse, my horse. The scene was intensely dramatic, and recalled vividly to the bystanders the cry of Richard III on the field of Bosworth. Grant listened a moment without changing his position or ceasing his whittling, and then remarked, They are not fighting. The firing is all on one side. It takes two sides to start a fight. In a few minutes, the firing died away, and it was found that the enemy was not advancing. The incident fairly illustrates the contrast in the temperaments of these two distinguished soldiers. At eleven o'clock, word came to Grant and Meade that their headquarters escorts and wagons were delaying the advance of Warren's corps, and they decided to move on to Todd's tavern in order to clear the way. The woods were still on fire along parts of the main road, which made it almost impassable, so that the party turned out to the right into a side road. 
The intention was to take the same route by which the cavalry had advanced, but it was difficult to tell one road from another. The night was dark, the dust was thick, the guide who was directing the party became confused, and it was uncertain whether we were going in the right direction or riding into the lines of the enemy. The guide was for a time suspected of treachery, but he was innocent of such a charge and had only lost his bearings. Colonel Comstock rode on in advance, and hearing the sound of marching columns not far off on our right, came back with this news, and it was decided to return to the Brock Road. General Grant at first demurred when it was proposed to turn back and urged the guide to try and find some crossroad leading to the Brock Road to avoid retracing our steps. This was an instance of his marked aversion to turning back, which amounted almost to a superstition. He often put himself to the greatest personal inconvenience to avoid it. When he found he was not traveling in the direction he intended to take, he would try all sorts of cross-cuts, ford streams, and jump any number of fences to reach another road rather than go back and take a fresh start. If he had been in the place of the famous apprentice boy who wandered away from London, he would never have been thrice mayor of that city, for with him, bow bells would have appealed to deaf ears when they chimed out, Turn again, Whittington. The enemy who encountered him never failed to feel the effect of this inborn prejudice against turning back. However, a slight retrograde movement became absolutely necessary in the present instance, and the general yielded to the force of circumstances. An orderly was stationed at the fork of the roads to indicate the right direction to Warren's troops when they should reach that point, and our party proceeded to Todd's Tavern, reaching there soon after midnight. It was learned afterward that Anderson's Longstreet's corps had been marching parallel with us, and at a distance of less than a mile, so that the apprehension felt was well-founded, the general and staff bivouacked upon the ground. The night was quite chilly, and a couple of fires were lighted to add to our comfort. General Grant lay down with his officers beside one of the fires, without any covering. When asleep, an aide quietly spread an overcoat over him. For about four hours we all kept turning over every few minutes, so as to get warmed on both sides, imitating with our bodies the diurnal motion of the earth as it exposes its sides alternately to the heat of the sun. When daylight broke, it was seen that a low board structure close to which the general-in-chief had lain down was a pig pen. But its former occupants had disappeared, and were probably at that time nourishing the stomachs of the cavalry troopers of the invading army. Unfortunately, the odors of the place had not taken their departure with the pigs, but remained to add to the discomfort of the bivouackers. Sheridan's cavalry had had a fight at this place the afternoon before, in which he had defeated the opposing force, and the ground in the vicinity, strewn with the dead, offered ample evidence of the severity of the struggle. At daylight on the morning of the 8th, active operations were in progress throughout the columns. General Sheridan had ordered his cavalry to move by different roads to seize the bridges crossing the Po River. General Meade modified these orders and directed a portion of the cavalry to move in front of Warren's infantry on the Spotsylvania Courthouse Road. The enemy was felling trees and placing other obstacles in the way to impede the movement, and the cavalry was afterward withdrawn and the infantry directed to open the way. About sunrise, General Grant, after taking off his coat and shaking it to rid it of some of the dust in which he had lain down, shared with the staff officers some soldiers' rations, and then seated himself on the ground by the roadside to take his morning smoke. Soon afterward he and General Meade rode on and established their respective headquarters near Piney Branch Church, about two miles to the east of Todd's Tavern. It was Sunday, but the overrunning of the country by contending armies had scattered the little church's congregation. The temple of prayer was voiceless. The tolling of its peaceful bell had given place to the echo of hostile guns, and in the excitement which prevailed, it must be confessed that few recalled the fact that it was the Sabbath day. A drum corps in passing caught sight of the general and at once struck up a then popular Negro camp meeting air. Everyone began to laugh and Rawlins cried, Good for the drummers! What's the fun? inquired the general. 
Why, was the reply, they are playing, ain't I glad to get out of the wilderness. The general smiled at the ready wit of the musicians and said, Well, with me, a musical joke always requires explanation. I know only two tunes. One is Yankee Doodle, and the other isn't. Charles A. Dana, Assistant Secretary of War, joined us during the forenoon, coming from Washington by way of Rappahannock Station, and remained at headquarters most of the time through the entire campaign. His daily, and sometimes hourly, dispatches to the War Department, giving the events occurring in the field, constituted a correspondence which is a rare example of perspicuity, accuracy, and vividness of description. Sheridan had been sent for by Meade to come to his headquarters, and when he arrived, between eleven and twelve o'clock that morning, a very acrimonious dispute took place between the two generals. Meade was possessed of an excitable temper which, under irritating circumstances, became almost ungovernable. He had worked himself into a towering passion regarding the delays encountered in the forward movement, and when Sheridan appeared, went at him hammer and tongs, accusing him of blunders and charging him with not making a proper disposition of his troops and letting the cavalry block the advance of the infantry. Sheridan was equally fiery and, smarting under the belief that he was unjustly treated, all the hotspur in his nature was aroused. He insisted that Meade had created the trouble by countermanding his Sheridan's orders and that it was this act which had resulted in mixing up his troops with the infantry, exposing to great danger Wilson's division, which had advanced as far as Spotsylvania Courthouse and rendering ineffectual all his combinations regarding the movements of the cavalry corps. Sheridan declared with great warmth that he would not command the cavalry any longer under such conditions, and said if he could have matters his own way he would concentrate all the cavalry, move out in force against Stuart's command, and whip it. His language throughout was highly spiced and conspicuously italicized with expletives. General Meade came over to General Grant's tent immediately after and related the interview to him. The excitement of the one was in singular contrast with the calmness of the other. When Meade repeated the remarks made by Sheridan that he could move out with his cavalry and whip Stuart, General Grant quietly observed, Did Sheridan say that? Well, he generally knows what he is talking about. Let him start right out and do it. By one o'clock, Sheridan had received his orders in writing from Meade for the movement. Early the next morning, he started upon his famous raid to the vicinity of Richmond in rear of the enemy's army and made good his word. After the interview just mentioned, the general-in-chief talked for some time with officers of the staff about the results of the battle of the previous days. He said in this connection, all things in this world are relative. While we were engaged in the wilderness, I could not keep from thinking of the first fight I ever saw, the Battle of Palo Alto. As I looked at the long line of battle consisting of three thousand men, I felt that General Taylor had such a fearful responsibility resting upon him that I wondered how he ever had the nerve to assume it, and when, after the fight, the casualties were reported, and the losses ascertained to be nearly sixty in killed, wounded, and missing, the engagement assumed a magnitude in my eyes which was positively startling. When the news of the victory reached the States, the windows in every household were illuminated, and it was largely instrumental in making General Taylor President of the United States. Now, such an affair would scarcely be deemed important enough to report to headquarters. He little thought at that moment that the battles then in progress would be chiefly instrumental in making the commander himself President of the United States. The movements of the opposing armies now became one of the most instructive lessons in the art of modern warfare. They showed the closeness of the game played by the two great masters who commanded the contending forces and illustrated how thoroughly those skilled fencers had cart and tierce at their fingers' ends. They demonstrated also how far the features of a campaign may be affected by accidents and errors. In the wilderness, the maneuvers had been largely a game of blind man's buff. They now became more like the play of Pussy Wants a Corner. Anderson had been ordered by Lee on the evening of May 7th to start for Spotsylvania Courthouse the next morning. But Anderson, finding the woods on fire and no good place to go into camp, 
kept his troops in motion, continued his march all night, and reached Spotsylvania in the morning. The cavalry which Sheridan had placed at the bridges over the Po River might have greatly impeded Anderson's march, but owing to conflicting orders the movements of the cavalry had been changed, and Anderson occupied a position at Spotsylvania that morning as the result of a series of accidents. When Lee found our wagon trains were moving in an easterly direction, he made up his mind that our army was retreating and telegraphed on the 8th to his government at Richmond. The enemy has abandoned his position and is moving toward Fredericksburg. He sent an order the same day to Early, then commanding Hill's Corps, saying, Move by Todd's Tavern along the Brock Road as soon as your front is clear of the enemy. It will be seen that in this order he directed a corps to move by a road which was then in full possession of our forces, and Early did not discover this fact till he actually encountered Hancock's troops at Todd's Tavern. Early was then compelled to take another road. It was after these movements that General Grant uttered the aphorism, Accident often decides the fate of battle. At 11.30 a.m., General Grant sent a telegram to Halleck, saying, The best of feeling prevails. Route to the James River not yet definitely marked out. In talking over the situation at headquarters, he said, It looks somewhat as if Lee intends to throw his army between us and Fredericksburg in order to cut us off from our base of supplies. I would not be at all sorry to have such a move made, as in that case I would be in rear of Lee and between him and Richmond. That morning, May 8th, the troops under Warren encountered those of Anderson's Corps, who were entrenched near Spotsylvania. Warren attacked, but was not able to make much progress, and decided to strengthen his own position and wait until other troops came to his assistance before giving battle. His men had suffered great hardships, they had been under fire for four days, and had just made a long night march to reach their present position. Late in the afternoon Warren and Sedgwick were ordered to attack with all their forces, but it was nearly dark before the assault could be made, and then only half of Sedgwick's command and but one of Warren's divisions participated. There was no decided result from this day's fighting. Late in the afternoon of the 8th headquarters were moved south about two miles, and camp was pitched in the angle formed by the intersection of the Brock Road with the road running south from Piney Branch Church. Lee had by this time comprehended Grant's intentions and was making all haste to throw his troops between the Union Army and Richmond and take up a strong defensive position. Most of the officers of the staff had been in the saddle since daylight, communicating with the Corps commanders, designating the lines of march, and urging forward the troops. And as soon as the tents were pitched that night, all who could be spared for a while from duty turned in to catch as many winks of sleep as possible. Everyone at headquarters was up at daylight the next morning, prepared for another active day's work. Hancock was now on the right, Warren next, then Sedgwick. Burnside was moving down to go into position on the extreme left. The general expressed his intention to devote the day principally to placing all the troops in position, reconnoitering the enemy's line, and getting in readiness for a combined attack as soon as proper preparations for it could be made. The country was more open than the wilderness, but it still presented obstacles of a most formidable nature. Four rivers run in a southeasterly direction, some early pioneer, ingenious in systematic nomenclature and who was evidently possessed of a due regard for helps to human memory, had named the streams respectively, beginning with the most southerly, the Mat, the Ta, the Po, and the Ni, and then deployed these terms in single line closed them in until they were given a touch of the elbow, and called the formation the Mattapony, the name by which the large river is known into which the four smaller ones flow. Spotsylvania Courthouse lies between the Po and the Knee. While these streams are not wide, their banks are steep in some places and lined by marshes in other. The country is undulating, and was at that time broken by alternations of cleared spaces and dense forests. In the woods there was a thick tangled undergrowth of hazel, dwarf pine, and scrub oak. A little before eight o'clock on the morning of May 9th, the general mounted his horse 
and directed me and two other staff officers to accompany him to make an examination of the lines in our immediate front. This day he rode a black pony called Jeff Davis, given that name because it had been captured in Mississippi on the plantation of Joe Davis, a brother of the Confederate president. It was turned into the quartermaster's department, from which it was purchased by the general on his Vicksburg campaign. He was not well at that time, being afflicted with boils, and he took a fancy to the pony because it had a remarkably easy pace, which enabled the general to make his long daily rides with much more comfort than when he used the horses he usually rode. Little Jeff soon became a conspicuous figure in the Virginia campaign. We proceeded to Sedgwick's command, and the general had a conference with him in regard to the part his corps was to take in the contemplated attack. Both officers remained mounted during the interview. The gallant commander of the famous Sixth Corps seemed particularly cheerful and hopeful that morning, and looked the picture of buoyant life and vigorous health. When his chief uttered some words of compliment upon his recent services, and spoke of the hardships he had encountered, Sedgwick spoke lightly of the difficulties experienced, and expressed every confidence in the ability of his troops to respond heroically to every demand made upon them. When the general-in-chief left him, Sedgwick started with his staff to move farther to the front. Our party had ridden but a short distance to the left when General Grant sent me back to Sedgwick to discuss with him further, a matter which it was thought had not been sufficiently emphasized in their conversation. While I was following the road I had seen him take, I heard musketry firing ahead and soon saw the body of an officer being borne from the field. Such a sight was so common that ordinarily it would have attracted no attention, but my apprehensions were aroused by seeing several of General Sedgwick's staff beside the body. As they came nearer, I gave an inquiring look. Colonel Beaumont, of the staff, cast his eyes in the direction of the body, then looked at me with an expression of profound sorrow, and slowly shook his head. His actions told the whole sad story. His heroic chief was dead. I was informed that as he was approaching an exposed point of the line to examine the enemy's position more closely, General McMahon, of his staff, reminded him that one or two officers had just been struck at that spot by sharpshooters and begged him not to advance farther. At this suggestion the general only smiled and soon after had entirely forgotten the warning. Indifferent to every form of danger, such an appeal made but little impression upon him. His movements led him to the position against which he had been cautioned, and he had scarcely dismounted and reached the spot on foot when a bullet entered his left cheek just below the eye, and he fell dead. As his lifeless form was carried by, a smile still remained upon his lips. Sedgwick was essentially a soldier. He had never married, the camp was his home, and the members of his staff were his family. He was always spoken of familiarly as Uncle John, and the news of his death fell upon his comrades with a sense of grief, akin to the sorrow of a personal bereavement. I rode off at once to bear the sad intelligence to the general-in-chief. For a few moments he could scarcely realize it, and twice asked, Is he really dead? The shock was severe, and he could ill conceal the depth of his grief. He said, his loss to this army is greater than the loss of a whole division of troops. General Wright was at once placed in command of the Sixth Corps. At daylight on May 9th, Burnside had moved down the road from Fredericksburg, crossed the knee, driven back a force of the enemy, and finally reached a position within less than two miles of Spotsylvania. By noon it was found that the Confederate army occupied an almost continuous line in front of Spotsylvania, in the form of a semicircle, with the convex side facing north. The demonstrations made by Lee, and the strengthening of his right, revived in General Grant's mind the impression that the enemy might attempt to work around our left and interpose between us and Fredericksburg. And preparations were made in such case to attack Lee's left, turn it, and throw the Union army between him and Richmond. At noon a package of dispatches from Washington reached headquarters, and were eagerly read. They announced that Sherman's columns were moving successfully in northwestern Georgia, that Resaca was threatened, and that Joe Johnston was steadily retreating. A report from Butler, dated the 5th, 
stated that he had landed at City Point, and reports of the 6th and 7th announced that he had sent out reconnoitering parties on the Petersburg Railroad and had dispatched troops to take possession of it, that he had had some hard fighting and was then entrenching and wanted reinforcements. General Grant directed the reinforcements to be sent. Siegel reported that he had not yet met the enemy and expected to move up the Shenandoah Valley and try to connect with Crook. General Grant did not express any particular gratification regarding these reports, except the one from Sherman, and in fact made very few comments upon them. Hancock had crossed the Po and was now threatening Lee's left. On the morning of the 10th, Hancock found the enemy's line strongly entrenched, and no general attack was made upon it. Lee had realized the danger threatened and had hurried troops to his left to protect that flank. Grant, perceiving this, decided that Lee must have weakened other portions of his line, and at once determined to assault his center. At 9.30 a.m., the general-in-chief sat down in his tent at his little camp table and wrote with his own hand, as usual, a dispatch to Halleck which began as follows. The enemy hold our front in very strong force and evince a strong determination to interpose between us and Richmond to the last. I shall take no backward steps. The last sentence, which I have italicized, attracted no notice at the time on the part of those who read it, but it afterward became historic and took a prominent place among the general's famous sayings. It was now suggested to him that it would be more convenient to move our camp farther to the left so as to be near the center, where the assault was to take place and orders were given to establish it a little more than a mile to the southeast, near the Alsop House. The tents were pitched in a comfortable-looking little dell on the edge of a deep wood and near the principal roads of communication. Chapter 6. Communicating with Burnside. Grant attacks the enemy's center. How a famous message was dispatched. News from the other armies. Preparing to attack the angle. An eventful morning at headquarters. Two distinguished prisoners. How the angle was captured. Scenes at the bloody angle. At half past ten on the morning of May 10th, the general in chief called me to where he was standing in front of his tent, spoke in much detail of what he wanted Burnside to accomplish, and directed me to go to that officer, explain to him fully the situation and the wishes of the commander, and remain with him on the left during the rest of the day. As I was mounting, the general added, I had started to write a note to Burnside, just wait a moment and I'll finish it, and you can deliver it to him. He stepped into his tent and returned in a few minutes and handed me the note. I set out at once at a gallop toward our left. There were two roads by which Burnside could be reached. One was a circuitous route some distance in rear of our lines. The other was much shorter, but under the enemy's fire for quite a distance. The latter was chosen on account of the time which would thereby be saved. When the exposed part of the road was reached, I adopted the method to which aides so often resorted when they had to take the chances of getting through with a message, and when those chances were not particularly promising, putting the horse on a run and throwing the body down along his neck on the opposite side from the enemy. Although the bullets did considerable execution in clipping the limbs of the trees and stirring up the earth, they were considerate enough to skip me. The horse was struck, but only slightly, and I succeeded in reaching Burnside rather ahead of schedule time. His headquarters had been established on the north side of the River Nye. I explained to him that a general attack was to be made in the afternoon on the enemy's center by Warren's and Hancock's troops, and that he was to move forward for the purpose of reconnoitering Lee's extreme right and keeping him from detaching troops from his flanks to reinforce his center. If Burnside could see a chance to attack, he was to do so with all vigor and, in a general way, make the best cooperative effort that was possible. A little while before, the heroic Stevenson, commander of his first division, had been struck by a sharpshooter and killed. He had served with Burnside in the North Carolina expedition, and the general was much attached to him. He felt his loss keenly and was profuse in his expressions of grief. The forward movement was ordered at once. Burnside was in great doubt as to whether he should concentrate his three divisions and attack the enemy's right vigorously or demonstrate with two divisions 
and placed the third in rear of Mott, who was on his right. I felt sure that General Grant would prefer the former, and or get it strenuously. But Burnseed was so anxious to have General Grant make a decision in the matter himself that he sent him a note at 2.15 p.m. He did not get an answer for nearly two hours. The general said in his reply that it was then too late to bring up the 3rd Division, and he thought that Burnside would be secure in attacking as he was. I had ridden with General Burnside to the front to watch the movement. The advance soon reached a point within a quarter of a mile of Spotsylvania and completely turned the right of the enemy's line. But the country was so bewildering and the enemy so completely concealed from view that it was impossible at the time to know the exact relative positions of the contending forces. Toward dark Wilcox's division had constructed a line of fence-rail breastworks and held pretty securely his advanced position. I had sent two bulletins to General Grant describing the situation on the left, but the orderly who carried one of the dispatches never arrived, having probably been killed, and the other did not reach the general till quite late as he was riding among the troops in front of the center of the line, and it was difficult to find him. I started for headquarters that evening, but owing to the intense darkness, the condition of the roads, and the difficulty of finding the way, did not arrive till long after midnight. The same day, May 10th, had witnessed important fighting on the right and center of our line. Hancock moved his troops back to the north side of the Po. Barlow's division, while withdrawing, became isolated, and was twice assaulted, but each time repulsed the enemy. The losses on both sides were heavy. Wright had formed an assaulting force of twelve regiments and placed Colonel Emery Upton in command. At 4 p.m., Wright, Warren, and Mott moved their commands forward, and a fierce struggle ensued. Warren was repulsed with severe loss, and Mott's attack failed, but Upton's column swept through the enemy's line, carrying everything before it, and capturing several guns and a number of prisoners. Unfortunately, the troops ordered to his support were so slow in reaching him that he had to be withdrawn. The men had behaved so handsomely, however, and manifested such a desire to retake the position that General Grant had additional troops brought up and ordered another assault. Again a rush was made upon the enemy's line, and again the same gallantry was shown. Many of our men succeeded in getting over the earthworks, but could not secure a lodgment which could be held, and as the assaults at other points were not made with the dash and spirit exhibited by Upton, his troops were withdrawn after nightfall to a position of greater security, in which they would not be isolated from the rest of the forces. He was compelled to abandon his captured guns, but he brought away all his prisoners. Upton had been severely wounded. General Grant had obtained permission of the government before starting from Washington to promote officers on the field for conspicuous acts of gallantry, and he now conferred upon Upton the well-merited grade of Brigadier General. Colonel Samuel S. Carroll was also promoted to the rank of Brigadier General for gallantry displayed by him in this action. Lee had learned by this time that he must be on the lookout for an attack from Grant at any hour, day, or night. He sent Ewell a message on the evening of the 10th, saying, It will be necessary for you to re-establish your whole line tonight. Perhaps Grant will make a night attack, as it was a favored amusement of his at Vicksburg. While the general-in-chief was out on the lines supervising the afternoon attack, he dismounted and sat down on a fallen tree to write a dispatch. While thus engaged, a shell exploded directly in front of him. He looked up from his paper an instant and then, without the slightest change of countenance, went on writing the message. Some of the 5th Wisconsin wounded were being carried past him at the time, and Major E. R. Jones of that regiment said, and he mentions it in his interesting book of reminiscences published since, that one of his men made the remark, Ulysses don't scare worth a dean. The 11th of May gave promise of a little rest for everybody as the commander expressed his intention to spend the day simply in reconnoitering for the purpose of learning more about the character and strength of the enemy's entrenchments and discovering the weakest points in his line, with a view to breaking through. He sat down at the mess table that morning and made his entire breakfast off a cup of coffee and a small piece of beef cooked almost to a crisp. 
for the cook had by this time learned that the nearer he came to burning up the beef, the better the general liked it. During the short time he was at the table, he conversed with Mr. Elihu B. Washburn, who had accompanied headquarters up to this time, and who was now about to return to Washington. After breakfast, the general lighted a cigar, seated himself on a camp chair in front of his tent, and was joined there by Mr. Washburn and several members of the staff. At half-past eight o'clock, the cavalry escort, which was to accompany the congressman, was drawn up in the road nearby, and all present rose to bid him goodbye. Turning to the chief, he said, General, I shall go to see the President and the Secretary of War as soon as I reach Washington. I can imagine their anxiety to know what you think of the prospects of the campaign, and I know they would be greatly gratified if I could carry a message from you giving what encouragement you can as to the situation. The general hesitated a moment and then replied, We are certainly making fair progress, and all the fighting has been in our favor. But the campaign promises to be a long one, and I am particularly anxious not to say anything just now that might hold out false hopes to the people. And then, after a pause, added, However, I will write a letter to Halleck, as I generally communicate through him, giving the general situation, and you can take it with you. He stepped into his tent, sat down at his field table, and, keeping his cigar in his mouth, wrote a dispatch of about two hundred words. In the middle of the communication occurred the famous words, I propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. When the letter had been copied, he folded it and handed it to Mr. Washburn, who thanked him warmly, wished him a continuation of success, shook hands with him and with each of the members of the staff, and at once mounted his horse and rode off. The staff officers read the retained copy of the dispatch, but neither the general himself nor anyone at headquarters realized the epigrammatic character of the striking sentence it contained until the New York papers reached camp a few days afterward, with the words displayed in large headlines and with conspicuous comments upon the force of the expression. It was learned afterward that the President was delighted to read this dispatch giving such full information as to the situation, and that he had said a few days before, when asked by a member of Congress what Grant was doing. Well, I can't tell much about it. You see, Grant has gone to the wilderness, crawled in, drawn up the ladder, and pulled in the hole after him, and I guess we'll have to wait till he comes out before we know just what he's up to. The general was now awaiting news from Butler and Sheridan with some anxiety. While maturing his plans for striking Lee, he was at the same time keeping a close lookout to see that Lee was not detaching any troops with the purpose of crushing Butler's or Sheridan's forces. This day, May 11th, the looked-for dispatches arrived, and their contents caused no little excitement at headquarters. The general, after glancing over the reports hurriedly, stepped to the front of his tent and read them aloud to the staff officers, who had gathered about him, eager to learn the news from the cooperating armies. Butler reported that he had a strongly entrenched position at Bermuda Hundred, in the angle formed by the James and Appomattox rivers, that he had cut the railroad, leaving Beauregard's troops south of the break and had completely whipped Hill's force. Sheridan sent word that he had torn up ten miles of the Virginia Central Railroad between Lee's army and Richmond, and had destroyed a large quantity of medical supplies and a million and a half of rations. The general-in-chief expressed himself as particularly pleased with the destruction of the railroad in rear of Lee, as it would increase the difficulty of moving troops suddenly between Richmond and Spotsylvania for the purpose of reinforcing either of those points. As usual, the contents of these dispatches were promptly communicated to Generals Meade and Burnside. The result of the day's work on our front was to discover more definitely the character of the salient in Lee's defenses on the right of his center. It was in the shape of a V with a flattened apex. The ground in front sloped down toward our position and was in most places thickly wooded. There was a clearing, however, about four hundred yards in width immediately in front of the apex. Several of the staff officers were on that part of the field a great portion of the day. At three o'clock in the afternoon, the general had thoroughly matured his plans and sent instructions to Meade directing him to move Hancock with all possible secrecy under cover of night to the left of right, and to make a vigorous assault on the angle at dawn the next morning. 
Warren and Wright were ordered to hold their corps as close to the enemy as possible and to take advantage of any diversion caused by this attack to push in if an opportunity should present itself. A personal conference was held with the three corps commanders, and every effort made to have a perfect understanding on their part as to exactly what was required in this important movement. Colonels Comstock and Babcock were directed to go to Burnside that afternoon and to remain with him during the movements of the next day, in which he was to attack simultaneously with Hancock. The other members of the staff were sent to keep in communication with the different portions of Hancock's line. The threatening sky was not propitious for the movement, but in this entertainment there was to be no postponement on account of the weather, and the preparations went on regardless of the lowering clouds and falling rain. All those who were in the secret anticipated a memorable field day on the morrow,